Hello and welcome back to Redirected. My name is Andrew East and this is a show where we sit down with celebrities, athletes, entrepreneurs, really anybody who has experienced a pivot or change in life. At some point or another, we all go through them. And so I want to sit down with people who have made it through these changes well in order to glean some wisdom, yes, but also hear some pretty entertaining stories. And so today we are actually continuing our Forbes 30 Under 30 series where we sit down with young, ambitious people who are working to change the future. And our guest today is Kevin Gould. And he is a LA-based entrepreneur, uh, actually named to Variety Magazine's Dealmakers Impact list in 2019 on top of the Forbes 30 Under 30 honor. And uh, he works in the digital space um, regarding the scale of influencers. He speaks on brand building and influencer engagement and partnerships and what brands should keep in mind uh, as they work with these influencers. Kevin has also worked with BeautyCon and Team 10, which is the Jake Paul project. And he manages top talent like Sniper Wolf, who currently has 18 and a half million subscribers. And he's expanded into brand development with this company that does brand consulting, talent management, and angel investing, which is called Combo Ventures. Clearly, Kevin has his hands full, and I'm honored that uh, he made room in his schedule to sit down with us. If you want to find out more about Kevin and what he's up to, including links to his social accounts, I will link those down below. And before we roll into it, if you haven't subscribed to the show and given a rating, please do so on whatever platform you're listening on. Without further ado, I bring you Kevin Gould. Kevin, I am so appreciative that you took the time to sit down with me. On a personal note, I'm not sure there's anyone who I've interviewed that I've been more excited to talk about when it comes to the influencer space and social media and how people make that their careers. Uh, I'm a geek about it. And I know you have truly done this different and better than anyone else out there. So thank you for for giving me the time. Hi, Andrew. Thanks for having me, man. I'm really, really excited to chat with you. I always like to kind of set the scene. If you could talk about what your foundation is like, kind of the context in which you grew up, like what did yep. your parents do even, things like that. Yeah, yeah. that helped you get interested in what you're doing now. For sure. So I, uh, I grew up for most of my life in North Carolina. So I uh, lived in Greensboro most of my life. It was interesting because my mom was a, you know, middle-class family. My mom was a, uh, a grief counselor and then my dad was a professor of sports psychology. So it was like a really interesting blend because I think early on from him, I learned a lot about, you know, mental toughness and sort of how to will things into existence. And really the belief that like anything is possible if you put your mind to it and like the, I, the, the ability to focus. And it was a little bit less of, you know, learning directly from him. It was sort of just seeing everything he was doing. At the time, he was working with a lot of, um, you know, high profile athletes, particularly in like individual sports. So if like you were a figure skater or a tennis player or a NASCAR driver, something that like really, um, you know, was like a uh, like that required a lot of mental toughness. Like I learned a lot from him on that end. Um, but yes, yeah, so I grew up in North Carolina. Wasn't really what, sure what I wanted to do. Knew I wanted to be in business in general, but at the time it wasn't like it was today. If you're seven, 16, 17, 18, where there's YouTube and there's this world of information, I really didn't know where to look from a business, um, you know, perspective. And I sort of just started like reading online at the time. Got really intrigued as I was as I was getting out of college in the entertainment business. Um, and, you know, kind of picked up everything and, and, you know, moved to, moved to LA, like right after, you know, right after college. So by the entertainment business, do you mean like the mainstream, like, like big production houses, Hollywood type of stuff? Uh, yeah. At the time. Right. Cause like the influencer space had not even come about yet. Right. This is like 2000, this is like 2008. I graduated college at the end of 07. And so the influencer ecosystem just hadn't come up yet. It was really like traditional Hollywood. And I was just really intrigued by that and then how that was an actual business. Um, and so I kind of made my way to LA. I ended up, uh, you know, landing a gig in the mailroom at WME, which is a talent agency. And it's literally like, it's, it was like a mailroom, man. It was, you would do, it, you would do anything an agent said. Um, but what you got out of it was you like learned the ropes, the entertainment business, you gained a lot of relationships and you sort of just got a really solid working understanding of like how the entire ecosystem works. And again, this is like pre influencers. This is mostly, I was working with actors. And so it was like the, it was like the young Hollywood, uh, you know, crew of 10 years ago, right? Like the one tree Hill kids or Glee kids or twilight. 
Um, and so it was a really great eye opener just to the entertainment business in general. Wait, One Tree Hill, do you know Jana Kramer? I know of Jana Kramer. I don't know her personally, but I, I know uh, Jana. And obviously they shot the show in, uh, in Wilmington. Oh, I did not know that actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Uh, WME, WME is, is it fair to say they're like the biggest talent agency? They, they are, and I mean, they, they've grown a lot even since I've left. I mean, they acquired IMG, they own the UFC now. They're more of, you know, they're really like an entertainment holding company at this point with, with one arm that's specifically on the, you know, on the agency side of the business representing talent. Wow. Um, was, was there part of you since your dad had the sports psychology back, which by the way, I had, I'm like the, a sports psychologist, worst nightmare, dude. I had like zero problems with my mental game when I, yeah. I played at Vanderbilt, which is a sec. And it's like, we're playing in front of big crowds. And then I show up to the NFL and I fell apart mentally, dude. It was crazy. So I had a couple conversations with the sports psychologist and it was like, man, I think I'm a lost cause. <laughs> so anyway, uh, but, it's, uh, it's, what, go ahead, it, go ahead. I was going to ask, did any part of you want to be like a, a, a an athlete agent or a, like a sports agent? Well, look, I wanted to be an athlete, but I just wasn't good enough, right? Like I was on, you know, I played basketball, I played football. I was always like on the team, but I was never one of the best guys on the team. Um, I thought about wanting to be a sports agent for a while because I, you know, had the opportunity to meet some agents when I, you know, I, I used to sort of go on trips with my dad to Wimbledon or whatever it may be. And, you know, for sure that was something I thought about for the while. And then ultimately I ended up gravitating uh, you know, towards, towards the entertainment space. Yeah. Last thing on sports psychology, it's that, that is such an interesting psychology in general, but sports psychology where like the Titans just recently had a, uh, eight year veteran long snapper, which is what my position was. So I always kind of keep an eye out for that. Like solid. This guy is gold. One of the best in the league. And then this year, just got the yips and anyway so um uh, it's it's, it's hard so by the way it's hard to get out of that rut man like once you're it's like it's like you said everything's good until it's not and then when it's not you really have to do the work and put in the work to figure out like how can you mentally prepare yourself to get out of that you know to get out of that uh that mindset and uh, yeah. it, it's uh and so i learned a lot of that just indirectly from you know watching my dad over the years yeah, and I'm I'm so fortunate for the space we're in now. Like YouTube really gave me a confidence in myself and my abilities that football I think like I lost a lot of that in with my experience in the NFL. But on that note of the social media, you know, world, how did and why did you transition out of W WME to some of the things you're doing now? Sure. So it's 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 I think it's, it's pretty interesting and, and it's, it's all, it's funny how like you ultimately end up, you go one direction, you end up another path, right? So I was at WME at the time and the agency world, as amazing as it was, right? It was very much like a big corporation. You start in the mailroom, you become an assistant, you become a junior agent, you become an agent. But even when you become an agent, you're servicing other people's clients because you're a young agent, right? And so it's really hard to actually go out and sign your own talent. It's very, it's a, it was a very like corporate hierarchy at the time because the digital space hadn't come up. But I was seeing that like, hmm, this is interesting. There's like this influencer ecosystem popping up. There's these YouTubers popping up. And separately, I was really, really intrigued with Silicon Valley. And so what I did was on uh, during the week, I would email a bunch of founders and VCs and just different entrepreneurs up in Silicon Valley. I'm like, hey, I work at WME. I'm on the entertainment side. I'm going to be in town this weekend. I'd love to meet with you. Um, and I did it because I was naturally curious about what's hap happening in Silicon Valley and the tech ecosystem. And then I realized that, you know, through a lot of those meetings, I'd, I'd work all day, you know, all week at WME. On Fridays, I'd fly up to Silicon Valley. I'd take meetings all weekend. And I really got to understand the space and realize there was a big gap between the entertainment world and the tech world. Both sides wanted to work together. They didn't know how. And so it actually didn't, it, it wasn't like a straight line path of influencers. I ended up leaving. And what it started with at the time was I was essentially running entertainment strategy and biz dev for series A, series B tech companies and consumer brands that didn't have uh, the Rolodex or relationships on the entertainment side. And through that, I, you know, the, basically the model was 
I take a retainer from these, these brands, I take equity in the brands, and then very quickly I realized, wow, they're really hard to get into as an investor. And so I started sort of taking all my money that I was saving up from the, the agency business I was creating, tripling down and doubling back down into investing in these companies. A um, couple of them really worked. And then, uh, you know, a year or two into that, I really saw the, how the influencer ecosystem was developing and sort of jumped back on the management side um, and was running those two things in parallel for, you know, a number of years. So you're involved with BeautyCon? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was one of the first investors in BeautyCon. Um, yeah. Wow. Was that... Was that one of your first foy? Like BeautyCon is pretty much exclusively influencer. Yeah. I feel like, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 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 it was heavily. So the, the whole premise, right? It was it was like the Super Bowl meets Coachella for the beauty space, right? And it's <laughs> all the biggest and best brands and all the biggest and best influencers in the space and bring them all together for like an immersive experience. And so I think it was interesting because being in an you know, I was managing talent before that, but what that did was two things. One, it opened my eyes to the beauty space, which I'll kind of get to like where I'm at today with the brands, which was massive, right? When you really look at the space and you're like, wow, this is an incredible ecosystem. It's very conducive to working with influencers, right? So the beauty space in general was one of the first sort of verticals that really leaned heavily into the influencer space. Um, and so that experience really, you know, really sort of just opened my eyes to ultimately what, you know, Combo Ventures is, you know, is today where there's sort of two, there's a few sides to the business. We've got the, the management side where we're managing digital talent. And then a few years ago, we started, um, you know, co-owning and operating direct consumer brands, primarily in the beauty space, some of them with influencers. And so, yeah, it was, it was really a, a really interesting time. Dude, I got to ask, like, it, it seems... I know you I, you probably moved up from the mailroom at WME, but to to have the courage to reach out to these Silicon Valley companies and book meetings while you're just working at the mailroom, like, well, you know what's, what's it, funny? It, it's funny, man, because you look to get to people, you have to figure out how you can bring them value, right? So whenever I tell young people they're reaching out on cold emails, it's like figure out something that you can bring to someone else instead of asking for something. So. I figured out that the relationships, the knowledge, even though I was this like young guy in the mailroom, was still more than they had, and they didn't get that up in Silicon Valley. So that was my way in, right? And so I think when you're doing that, you just have to figure out what's your sort of unique advantage that you can bring to the table to get in the room. Um, and you know, luckily for me, that was the sort of the experience and the entertainment side that I was bringing. That is such gold wisdom. That's worth discussing a little bit more when sean and i first got on youtube i did dude i must have sent out 700 emails to all like these biggest youtubers all who i knew had some type of gymnastics connection yep uh and so you know sean and i mostly sean is who i was focusing on of like she's an olympic gymnast and these people are connected to gymnastics for whatever whether it's their kids and like you know i did a bunch of this research and so we'd reach out and I'd said, hey, you know, we, we'd love to do a YouTube collab was, was what my end goal was. Here's a couple ideas that I think would be fun. And the reason this makes sense is because we're doing this with my, it, Sean, who's an Olympic gold medalist, right? And so in their eyes, it's like, oh my gosh, that's a unique advantage that no one else can provide. So that's amazing that you had that insight. I think 100%. And I think like a lot of people today, you know, they'll – reach out asking for something and they're they're obviously not realizing that everyone else is just as busy as they are and and um, while someone may want to give advice it, it, the reality is they're looking for things that can make their lives easier so i always tell someone like figure out how you can bring something you need to the table make their life easier um you know even for like us like on the on the e-com side like if someone emails me and says like hey i'd love to work for you like you know, great, I'll probably forward it to someone else. But if someone came to me and said, hey, I took a look at your website. Uh, I noticed five things that you could be doing differently. And these are like the changes I would make if I were to come in into your organization. That's a much more impactful email that took a lot of thought and time than just like, hey, I, you know, can I, can I get 20 minutes of your advice? 
Are, would you say you're like a natural born like connector or like ex extrovert? Or what's your personality type? It's interesting. I'm uh, I'm actually mostly introverted, but I think I'm really really extroverted uh, when it comes to business. Uh, but I but I, I personally just love being by myself and thinking a lot. Uh, and on the on the connecting side, that's also interesting because I'm mostly an introvert, but but in a weird way, I'm really good at that. But I've actually had to shift away a lot from that over the years because you know now there's I don't know we have 90 to 100 team members across all the brands. I'm much I've shifted a lot more of my attention onto the operating side and the, just the day to day operating of the business and like I'll always have that skill set there of you know biz dev and sales and connections and relationships and they definitely it definitely comes in in handy. Um, but I think you know you kind of have to gra gradually as the company grows shift your shift where your time is focused. And so today it's much more focused on the outside. Yeah. Are you natural, are you natural risk taker too? Cause it seems like some of the, there's some big pivotal decisions that you made of like going, I mean, trying to do this contractor role or consulting role that you were like on a retainer yeah. basis. That's not a steady income, you know? Yeah. It, uh, it's funny because I personally don't think I'm much of a risk taker because I feel like the risks I'm taking aren't that much of a risk in my head, right? Like all these brands I started, is it, if, if outside looking in, someone's like, you're crazy, you're starting a hair brand from scratch and you're going to put up a lot of your own money to do it, that probably looks crazy or like high risk to someone else. And I, I don't know, to me, I feel like every risk I take is, uh, I try to think through it thoughtfully and assess what the risk is. And of course there's risk there. Um, but I, I don't know, I feel like I look at it a little bit differently, but yes, I think from the outside looking in, if for someone to look at sort of the things, the risks I take, right. They're probably pretty risky. Yeah. Okay. So back, back to your career path too now. So you, beauty con happened. And then I know you had, um, interactions with team 10 and sniper War wolf. How, how did those relationships come about? Yeah, yeah. So the, the team 10, Jake, uh, I mean, that was the height of, you know, that was the height of like team 10. And Jake, that was wild, man. And that was another, they raised money, right? Yeah, yeah. That was a little bit pre me. I came on board and, and uh, you know, worked with them um, slightly after that. But what was interesting was and another eye opener for me is when we were in like the thick of it was the like just the the e-com opportunity that was coming off of the, the time merch right like today merch is sort of like a commodity every influencer's got merch but at the time i think what we were doing on the merch side was pretty um you know pretty new and unique and it was doing serious numbers and that was another thing that like really opened my eyes to just you know when you can work in parallel or with influencers sort of like the unique competitive advantage you have when building a brand i think the one thing about merch that i realized was like look merch is great but it's not a long lasting brand so like i saw like all right there's real revenue that can be driven through the influencer ecosystem but merch is not a brand it's like a great cash flow business and yeah. so what's the long term you know value you can build from building a brand so this is kind of where combo ventures comes in. It is the, the influence for lack of a better term that influencers have is I think underestimated by, by mainstream business. And I think most people in general. Yep. And so people like you, people like Jake Paul and team 10 as controversial as he is, um, or like, Mr. Beast now, how can you like the fact that Jake can say, Hey, here's some merch for sale. And you know, I'm sure it reached, if not in a, in one year, cumulatively, at least seven figures, maybe in a month, who knows, but like you can do some mad sales through that, yeah. but how can you actually make it a sustainable business? Right? So that's, yep. that's what I've been obsessed with trying to think about because I think it's it's almost like responsibility of I view it as responsibility of my wife and I to like use this influence which she has garnished way more legitimately than me but like people look up to this and it's like don't don't like just 
sell merch doing that, like actually build a business, right? Sure. And I think a good way to look at it is whatever you build eventually has to be bigger than you, right? Yes. So, you, you know, the, the influencer, uh, like I think Wakeheart, one of my brands is a good example. So we I, uh, co-own a brand with the Dolan twins called Wakeheart. It's a, it's a fragrance and scent brand that's really like aimed at Gen Z and young millennials, um, like a unisex fragrance and candle brand. And like they were the jumping off point but, and, and, and they were like the backbone to get the brand started. But the whole goal from the beginning was how can we make this bigger than them over time? And that requires doing a lot of different things that you would still normally have to do to build a brand. It's just, they, gave, they really gave us a head start. Um, obviously we brought in a lot of sales from the beginning from them, but no matter how big you are as an influencer, you're always gonna tap out at some point on like how much you can reach your audience. And so, You've got to keep, you've got to, you've got to like think forward to, okay, two years from now, how is this going to be bigger than us? Right. Um, and I think like whenever you're building something, you've got to make sure you're not in it for like the, the thing I love about the guys, the Dolan twins is that like they're, they're in it for the long haul. They really were passionate about fragrance. Um, they're super involved in the creative, uh, um, you know, creative direction everywhere we're going with the brand. And they're willing to uh, put aside upfront reward for you know for a long term reward, right? Like like we're investing heavily into the future of the brand and you know building out a, a bigger product pipeline, and uh, and so I think you kind of have to look at all those things if, if you're an influencer that's building a building a brand. Is it hard for you to make us? I I don't know how the relationship usually forms between you and influencers, but is it hard to? You know, the Dolan twins have however many millions of followers, tens of millions of followers. Is there like a, from their point, hey, who are you to want to, of course you want to do business with us. Like, what do you have to offer? Like, how does the sales pitch go from your end? It, yeah, it, it honestly wasn't a pitch. It was, we sat down and I, honestly, I think in, and this is on, in any business relationship, like I don't look at it as just an influencer. Um, if they're going to come in as my business partner and I'm going to come in as, as their business partner, there's got to be like a trust factor there. I personally only want to work with really good people, um, you know, for like to build a long-term business with. So like, like one, they're really, really great guys and someone I want to build a business with. And then I think, you know, on their end, they were probably looking at, okay, do, do we have the capability to actually build a brand we're all talking about doing? Cause in the end it all comes down to execution. And so, I think it was all of those things together that both sides were looking at. It definitely wasn't a sales pitch. Um, and, and I think everything I've done is I really try to stay away from that. It's, it's gotta be more like a, a real fit for both sides. Yeah. Yeah. It, it is back, back to your point of how can you grow up bigger than yourself? It's so interesting when I've been frustrated by influencers who are way larger than us and can, you know, drive more traffic than us. But when you, when, when I bump into someone who does a bunch of Facebook ads yep. uh, and they have like a hundred thousand followers because that's where the traffic's going to or through uh, to sell their product yep. versus someone who has a, like a, a true influencer who has a hundred thousand followers and they're like trying to, trying to do brand sponsorships or like go about it in the true influencer way. It's like, you have to think bigger and you have to think different than just oh, i want to be a full-time TikToker, youtuber like like that's that's phase one i feel like the the next phase is like building brands building teams and then well, ideally these brands as you say don't even have to be related to you or associated with you in any way now you're just a part of this business that will outlast you and it's something that's lost, I think, from an influencer's perspective so much. A hundred, a hundred percent. And like, again, I think the long-term value you guys are building for your channel is incredible. And like, if you really take a step back and you, if you take like a five year, seven year window on this thing, there's so much upside for like the foundation that you guys are building now that you're going to be able to build so many things off of because it's compounding interest from the community that you're building. And, and I think like the other, the, the other thing I think a lot of times influencers do is they'll just, they, they'll, they'll strike too quick and not thoughtfully enough. 
So they're just trying to like make the quick buck again. They're trying to get something out and they're not thinking about like, what is this thing going to turn into or what is this going to be? Um, and, and ultimately it becomes a short-term thing and not a long-term thing because they're thinking about it short-term, right? Yeah. Yeah. Wait, I mean, we've, yes, it's very tempting to do that too. When you know you could do X amount of sales, right? And we've, we did that a little bit when we first came out with our, our merch brand yeah. to a certain extent. It was like, we, we, we launched it because it was kind of a unique to when we were having a child and like this interesting yeah. phase that was in our lives and our community's lives. Yep. So, but then it was like, you know, Oh, we actually don't want to just keep selling merch with cute quotes or our, our right. name on it. Like there's no point to it in our mind. Oh. Right. The way, the way I look at it for, you know, for anyone that's like, you know, mid tier to like a larger tier influencer is I use this acronym called Leo. So it's like, do you license, do you endorse or do you own? Right. So like if it's something, you know, you're never going to build on your own, just making this up like a, a big drink brand, go do the deal with Coca-Cola, right? Take the check because um, you're never going to do it on your own. You might as well take the endorsement money because you obviously need to live and you need to take, you know, you should take the check. Um, again, if it's something that you probably don't want to build yourself, but you think there's maybe value there, like for example, uh, posters, like you can do a license deal with a poster company or whatever it may be, right? If it's, if it's like a young TikToker right now, they can go do their licensing deals where they're making incremental revenue from licensing. And then on the ownership side, pick one or two, or at most three things that you really want to go down the path that own, to own and build um, and own equity in. And then you sort of got like a diversified stream between the between the three, right? What, why is it three ownership? Uh, I think roles? I think I think above and beyond that. If it's like really, and and, and this is not like this is if you own it and you're run you're active and you're running it. One, you've only got so much uh, so much bandwidth on on an influencer's end of promotion, right? You you don't want to tap your audience. And just two, I think it's really hard to focus on any more than that number. Like for me, I've got these three brands right now. Um, Wait, you know, way card insert name here, which is the hair brand and Glen Medic. It's a lash brand. I don't plan on building any more brands the next year or two. Um, I, I think I'm a big believer in focus. It was aggressive enough to build three brands in parallel at the same time. And I, I just personally know my limits and I want like, I'd rather have three really, really great killer brands than like six that are just, you know, average. Cause I'm, I'm, I'm putting very limited amounts of attention to each of them. Can you talk, tell us about, uh, combo ventures how it started and then now what it is yeah 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 so it's it's funny it's just taking these different paths over the years where in the beginning right we were working heavily in the tech and consumer brand ecosystem and then we were still doing that for a while um and uh started getting a lot more active on the angel investing side and a lot of those companies i was involved in ramped up the influencer side of the business and went back to the entertainment roots and was managing talent and was doing both of those in parallel for a few years. Um, and then uh, and then really two and a half years ago was where it took the significant shift of where it is today. So um, I really decided I wanted to build brands. We've seen all of this uh, influence that influencers had around the e-commerce ecosystem, particularly beauty. The first brand um, I launched in the end of 2018 was a women's hair brand called Insert Name Here. Uh, I have two incredible business partners on that, Sharon and Jordan. And then uh, the two other brands, Wakeheart and then Glen Medic, which is a lash brand, were launched in uh, mid-2019. And it's crazy how quick it's uh, it's grown, man. I think, you know, everything's always a mix of like hard work, hard work and luck. COVID, uh, at the beginning, I was terrified for sure. And then thankfully, the e-com space really exploded with everyone staying home and, and um we, yeah, we, we really, really scaled the brands. It'll, we'll end the year with, you know, mid eight figures in revenue. And we're trying to set this thing up to, you know, hopefully do nine figures in revenue next year. So Wakeheart is a fragrance brand you co-founded with influencers, the Dolan twins. Were the other two influencer partnerships as well? So I would say they're both micro influencers. So Anne, who's my co-founder on Climatic, she, uh, has influence, but I wouldn't bucket her and that's not her full-time job. Right. And then Sharon and Jordan on insert name here, 
they also were micro, you know, 80, 100,000 followers on Instagram, like micro influencers, but that wasn't their full-time job. They were actually uh, the first two employees at ColourPop Cosmetics, which is a huge beauty brand. Wow. And so they are, both Ann and Sharon and Jordan are incredible on, you know, they're operating day to day. They're overseeing social, creative content, um, uh, a, a lot, half of the business, right? And so they've all been incredible partners. And the through line is when we started these businesses with all my partners, I was like, look, I don't want to get into the path of like going to raise all this VC money and losing money every month and, uh, you know, getting into the trap of just having to raise capital for a business that may or may not ever make money. And so, we were like, look, let's, let's, we, we have to set a goal to get these businesses profitable within six months or less. One took the full six months, two were profitable from day one. Um, and so we have not taken on any outside capital, self-funded everything, which is, it's really tempting to take on capital because it definitely, you know, gives a little bit of a relief, but I think it made, ultimately it made all the brands a lot stronger that we didn't. We had to be more resourceful. Uh, we had to be more creative. And uh, you have to minimize mistakes when it's your own money. You said Facebook just got a big shout out from, uh, or Glamnetics just got a big shout out from Facebook. Yeah, that was cool, man. We uh, so about two weeks ago, Facebook did their Q3 earnings, and uh, and we do a lot with Facebook on uh, on the digital advertising side. And so Cheryl Sandberg, you know, sort of chose Glammedic as the, the business that they, they were going to profile for the Q3 earnings, which was, that was cool to see, man. I think it was, it was, um, it was only, you know, they only talked about one business on the earnings call uh, to profile. So that was a, that was a fun experience. That's so sick. Dude. Yeah, yeah, it was cool. I think, but I, I think again, the through line is to like build a, a brand today. You have to be good at so many different things. There's not one thing that's going to make the brand pop. Like it's not just influencers. It's not just ads. You, you've got to be, you've got to be able to build a community. You have to have a strong product. You have to know how to work with influencers. Um, you have to know how to run ads, email, text message marketing. Like you've got to have the whole funnel down in order to scale it. Um, and if you're missing a couple of those pieces, it's going to get stuck. And you guys do all of that in house. We do everything in house except. So we outsource our, like we, we don't own our own fulfillment center, right? Like we outsource our yeah, fulfillment yeah, yeah. center. That, that's not our expertise, so it's something I'd rather outsource, but 95% of what we do is completely done in-house. And that was also like a really hard thing to build was to build that infrastructure. It was, uh, you know, cause it was just kind of pulling pieces here and there over the last couple of years to get to the place where we had, where, where we have it today, where very few things are actually outsourced. Like that includes the Facebook ads and everything you guys. Every, all of that's completely in house. We have an incredible creative team on each of the brands. Um, I mean, yeah, at, at all of that is is in house. So tell me about talent management, because real quick, goal of mine or like what we're looking to. So where Sean and I are is we realize okay, you know, there's several family vloggers out there. There's a lot, sorry, let me not understate that. There's a ton, but our goal when we create content is to encourage deeper family connection, right? Like all of our contents around marriage or around parenting or whatever we do as a family. And, uh, we stepped back and we said, okay, we're, you know, two white Midwestern people who now live in Nashville. That's a very limited worldview, if you will. Like what if we were able to, expand um our network whether it's like through a podcast network or like a vlog squad type of thing where we included other people from more diverse backgrounds to like you know not only in not only like share that perspective but i think it's also good from a just when you consider the community at large everybody's community it's like okay this would be this would build community in the larger sense too so we're producing like four or five shows of our own and we're in front of a camera for five hours a day. Like, and there's very little room for growth on our end. So we're also trying to protect our baby. We, we are working on this concept of, okay, if we were going to buy a house that was the family friendly version of like a TikTok house, right? Like where a collab group came together and they were all, you know, in each other's vlogs, et cetera. Um, 
how can we do that? And part of my concept is the talent management. And there's some yeah. people that are like, absolutely don't, you don't want to be in that business. And there's others that are like, you know what, as long as it's the right person, but what's, what's your take on the talent management piece? Well, so I think to go back for a second, the thing I love from hearing what you said is I love the idea about bringing together uh, diverse perspectives into the content because I think that's super important. I think uh, I think there's a lot that of different things that all of the channels, whoever you bring together, could learn about each other by doing that, and the audiences could learn. Yeah. So I think that's really really interesting, and I think you guys should 100 percent 100 percent go down that path and figure that out. The management side of things, I think. I think you, it really kind of comes down to like, what's the, you know, what's the long-term, long-term goal for, for you guys, for the channel, for what you want to build. Um, because, because ultimately management business does end up taking up a lot of time and it might be, it might be more worth it to just do that because you know, it's great for, you know, for you, for the audience, for the people that you're working with and to help build other people up. And then, everything always comes back, right? So like if you help other people out, uh, it's ultimately gonna help you out in the end with whatever you're building. Because building a management business takes an entire amount of focus um, away from like what you guys are doing now and it may or may not pay off long-term, right? Like if yeah. one or two of the people really pop and hit it big, for sure, there's real, you know, real revenue that can come from that. Um, but I, I think you really have to look at how much time is it actually gonna take to, you know, to deal with that. Now you're dealing with all the contracts for all of them. Like there's, there's a lot that goes, that, that goes into it. Are you still managing t Sniper Wolf? Yes. So I've been super interested in her because she's now fully a reaction channel, which is like yeah. so interesting and she's killing it. Like how many views a video, like four she's or five. Like 400 or 500 million views a month. I, uh, it's incredible. I think, but I think that goes to like, as an influencer, you always, the ones that stay on top are the ones that always can pivot. And what worked a year ago or six months ago, or even a month ago, isn't necessarily what works now, right? And so I think you constantly have to sort of reinvent your content and what you're doing um, because the space is moving so quickly. And I think that's like a great example of that. I mean, I think she leaned heavily into reaction content and it's working uh, more than extremely well for her right now and look in six months it may be something different right but i think the, the the influencers that stay on top figure out ways to constantly pivot pivot based on like where the space is going so from your perspective kevin not from an entertainment viewpoint but from an entrepreneurial viewpoint who are some cutting edge influencers that you've seen yeah i think um i think you know mr beast and what he's building is really, really interesting. Um, I kind of know, know a couple of guys behind that operation and I think they're doing a great job setting up the correct infrastructure to really build out some, you know, some interesting things. Uh, I think, I think on the celebrity side, which is a little, you know, kind of crossover influencer, obviously like what Kylie Jenner did with Kylie Cosmetics and everything else. I mean, that's sort of like the ultimate measure for success, right? Like she's seen a lot of success in building her own direct consumer brands. There's some smaller influencer, not smaller, but like not not the Kylies of the world that I think have done a great job brand building, um, particularly like in the in the the beauty space. I mean, I think you look at this one woman, Mariana Hewitt. She's got a brand called Summer Fridays. It's doing really well. Uh, you look at some of the things that like a James Charles is setting up the foundation for. I think that's really really interesting. I love Dobrik. I think Dobrik. Uh, I think Dobrik loves creating content from what I can tell. And um, I'm not, not close with him, so I don't, I don't want to say for sure, but I, I think he really likes creating content and, he's, and he loves that. I think there's a lot of like entrepreneurial ventures that he's now able to build off of that like really, really, really loyal audience that he's created. So I love what he's doing. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's 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 few and far in between though that are going to really be able to scale it to. There's a lot of people that can get to like seven figures in revenue. There's not many that can get to eight figures, and there's like, you know, two or three that can actually take to nine figures in revenue. Dog, I freaking love you. 
Yeah, I feel like you're a geek for this space, man. It's so I, fun, I love it, dude. Man. I, I love it. It's it's uh, I also I, I love being constantly curious too. So like, what I mean by that is and not just in the influencer space. Like, on TikTok, I'm consuming TikTok content and I'm consuming it. Sorry, my my, my FedEx guy just got here. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'm consuming. Um, TikTok content and I'm consuming it for fun, but I'm also consuming it to see what's happening in this space. Yeah. I'm listening to New Music Friday every every week because not I love music, but I also want to know what's happening in pop culture and what's like popping off in the music space. I'm re, you know, curious about political news. I'm curious about the stock market. And I think like it translates itself into the fast moving influencer world and the fast moving e-com world. Cause you always need to have a sense of what's happening in the world across all the different spectrums uh to really know directionally where everything is going yeah the i, I tell the story all the time but sean and i went to instagram headquarters wherever in playa vista or yo i think that's where it is um but we walk in and the first thing that our you know mentor said there was on our platform you need to create more than you consume Yep. And so that is the lens through which if I'm ever on Instagram, which, you know, I, I, I'm on Instagram on a YouTube, but it's not like, yes, I'm enjoying viewing the content, but it's also like, what can, what are the, the, the structure of their videos that, you know, they did this at the second minute, because I know that's where you're, you know what I'm saying? Like it, it's always yep. with this, uh, the creative filter, uh, yep. which I think is important. And also you don't want to, abuse social media in the sense of you're just, you know, blowing time on there. But yeah, yeah. I, uh, th this is a little off topic, but I feel like this, it just popped in my head and I was just talking to you. I feel like a platform you guys should really lean into that is, um, my friend Taylor calls it content deficient is LinkedIn. I think you guys could crush on LinkedIn with like repurposing video content and You've got all of, you know, from a, from a brand perspective, right? You've got all the brand executives that sit on LinkedIn all day. There's not enough content to go around. I think the angles that you guys are taking from a family channel are very, very appealing to the people that sit on LinkedIn. And there's really no influencer that's tapped into it the right way. So something to think about because I, I think you guys could really, really win there. And like, you obviously have to think about Instagram and YouTube and all the, the main platforms. But those platforms aren't deficient of content. They have plenty of content. Um, there's pockets right now like LinkedIn where I think someone like you guys can really go in and lean hard into um, if, uh, if, if you guys think it's something that's interesting. Dang, Kevin just dishing out the recommendation and wisdom. Okay. I, I, think, you, I think you guys, I don't know. I have a feeling you guys really pop, pop off on there. <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, we'll put some thought into it. I am curious though, because as you know, there's on that note of the daunting task of, you know, t tackling a new platform, we're building out a team and you've mentioned several times, like Mr. Beast building the infrastructure. What do you mean when you say that? Yeah. So I think for you guys, right. The first initial infrastructure is like, how do you set up the right infrastructure on the content business, which is a lot of the day to day of what you're doing. Right. So that's like, and I think the hardest thing for talent or influencers is delegating because a lot of them are very particular about the way they want things edited. Um, they, they have a very, very hard time delegating, but the ones that can really scale are the ones that figure out how to delegate things and give clear direction to whoever they're hiring. Right. So, if you guys are capped at the amount of content you can create, and I don't know your, your infrastructure you have, but like if you're capped at the amount of content that you can create, you've got to figure out how you bring on an editor or a team of editors that's chopping up that content and doing it for you and you're giving them clear direction. So stage one is get your content piece down. Mm -hmm. And then like after you figure that part out, then you can figure out like what else you need to bring on based on what you want to build, you know, build out, right? I mean, it's. What what is your setup, by the way? So right now, we have uh, we have two editors for our our long form YouTube content. We have one for our podcast interview shows. We have our talent, our digital agent who is responsible for that side of things. We have kind of uh, I'll call her an assistant, but she does way more than that. Who kind of 
knows when the due dates are and make sure that we fi we film, you know, whatever we need to uh, on project manager for everything you guys have. Yeah. So then we have project. Man well, yes, she's really like, she keeps us accountable, Sean and I, because we're always torn between, we work at home right now between family and whatever, like filming. Then we have a project manager for all the different things we have going on. So that that's four different people. Um, but that's been the, I spent the last four months just pulling my hair out, trying to figure, I went to business school, dog. I freaking did the whole thing. And then actually you're trying to figure out how to build a yeah. team. And again, like I've never actually talked about this, but like, you know, whatever, I was a captain of my college football team for two years. And it was like, yeah, I guess, you know, I guess I could call myself a leader yep. or whatever the frick that means. But I have honestly no idea how to build or lead a business. And I've been trying to freaking read books and listen to whatever the heck I need to, to try to do it right. Because I do want to, I do view the work that we're doing as important and I do want to do it for a long time. And I do want to impact millions more people. And so I don't want to, fall flat on our face and it's been like the biggest challenge to date but that's fun you know. man and by the way managing people was like an acquired skill because i don't think anyone starts as a great manager of people or necessarily like a great leader and you're constantly working on it as you go and like optimize everything's about optimization and constantly improving yourself right so like um it just i feel like the management of people part just comes with time and you get better and better uh, but I do think like to effectively manage people, you have to be clear about what you want, right? And so giving clarity to the people that you're managing around one, what you want them to do and how you want them to do it, but also why are they doing it and like what's the long-term vision? So I feel like it sounds like you've got a lot, you've got way more infrastructure set up than most other influencers, which is awesome. And then I think it's really, um, you know, I think it's like, taking a step back being like, okay, literally whiteboarding out, like where you guys may have already done this, but like, where do we want to go in five years? Like, what's the goal? Like, like, what do we want to achieve in the next five years? Um, here's the four things we want to like tackle our four main goals. Here's what we're doing in the next six months to a year to get there. And then you've literally got like, this is our 2021 plan for us. And then you can like tell the entire team what that plan is and they're all on the same page. Right. But I think if it's just they're working in like the, uh, what hasn't worked well for me, and I made these mistakes in the past for sure, is like if you're not giving the team a clear goal and directionally where the business is going, um, they don't know the why of why they're doing it. And then they're just not clear on what they're what they're supposed to be doing. Let me show you. This is, this is a big, big board. The, the white board over there. I do love it. I don't love. use nearly enough, but um, how big is your team? We've got between everything now, there's, I don't know, 90, 95 people. Um, each of, so a couple of the brands have like 35 management side of the business. We've got like 12. Uh, one of the other brands has like 10. Yeah, we're, I mean, we're about 95, 95 people. Um, and again, it, it, I have different co-founders on each of the brands. So, so um, I couldn't do it myself, right? There's not possible. And have amazing co-founders and and then we just also have an amazing team but we're growing really really quickly one thing i'm hyper obsessed with right now that is like one of the big things we're focused on next year is this concept called follow the sun so basically one of my friends who i was sitting with who works at a you know a consulting firm like a like a mckinsey style consulting firm right she, she i was telling her about how we i love di having diverse perspectives particularly from overseas and she was like, oh, well, there's this concept called follow the sun. And basically it's summed up in three words, what I've been thinking, but it's at when the sun sets here, right? It's coming up somewhere else. And so we've seen a lot of success hiring and building and scaling our internal teams, not only in the US, but also overseas. And we've been able to scale, like we've hired a lot of editors overseas, customer service, project managers, and we have a really, really big US team, but we've also been able to expand internationally. Um, and, and look, from a business perspective, obviously there's uh, economic, there's savings, right? But it's been really cool to like, I've become really good friends with a lot of these people on our team members overseas. And I think that 
when COVID hit and when it, we don't need to be in an office anymore, like we're running this whole thing virtually, we've hired 50 people virtually this, this year. Um, it just opened my eyes to like how the world can help you scale. And it's a big focus of mine going into to next year. What are your goals? What do you want to do? Um, well, look, I think the short term goals, short term meaning like a year, right, is stay focused. Uh, on the brand side of things, I think we've got a really, really good start on all three of the brands and they've scaled. I think what most people would say they've scaled pretty well, um, but we feel like all of them are just in the infancy of where they can go. And so we need to stay focused and like we have the key goals for what we want to do next year and it's just execute, right? It all comes down to execution. Um, same thing on the management side of the business. We have our goals there for the short term, the year. Long term, I want to figure out, um, you know, one thing I feel like I haven't done enough of is like figuring out what's like the purpose for why I'm doing all of this and like how philanthropy plays into things. And like, that's a like, look, I donate, I, you know, I'm philanthropic, right? But I want to figure out long term how everything I'm doing will ultimately just help people more in general. Um, and so if I can do that with like building things that I think are fun to build, like the thing I love about the brand side is you're building communities and you're building these like pockets of people that love what you're building and what you do, right? Which is a really cool feeling. Um, and it's the same thing, I'm, sh you know, when you're shooting your content and you have an audience base, right? And so I think like long-term for me, that's a big one. Um, and then I also just think like long-term, uh, you know, just making sure um, uh, I uh, I tend to like dive into work like a lot, and, like work really, really hard and just making sure I kind of keep that balance because obviously like building these things isn't all life is about. And so, uh, you know, just keeping a balanced perspective on everything. I'll give you a book recommendation if you give me one. Okay. I just, I just finished a book called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. It's okay. all about like, I got to figure out if, if, if it'd be your vibe, but it's all about like, okay, work is great and it gives you purpose. But if you could do what you enjoy most in life, what would you do? And it's yep. like, oh shoot. I actually, I've been so worried about business and my career that I haven't actually thought about what I love doing that much. So anyway, yeah. So it's called what the ruthless elimination of worry of, of hurry, hurry, of hurry. Okay. Cool. Uh, the one I would recommend is there's this guy in Naval who uh, runs a company called AngelList, and he, he's become pretty well known up in the valley, and he's very like, very philosophical. There's like it's called like the Naval. I think it's called the Naval Almanac. Is I can't fully pronounce his last name. I think it's Ravikant Naval Ravikant. Um, it's like the Naval Almanac, and it was one of the best books I've ever read in my life. Uh, I read it like a month ago. I was really, you know, really intrigued by it. I recently, and that's another thing I've been trying to do more is just read more because I read a lot of news. I read a lot of topical things. I wasn't doing a great job of just like reading long form content. And so I recently read a book called Sapiens, which was like the, basically the history of like humans yeah. and how small of like a time frame we've actually been on it's crazy man it's like it just was super insightful and um and just like a really really interesting read so those are the two i recommend back to your thoughts on philanthropy it is interesting to me and i need to constantly remind myself of this of like when you look at how a uh, the most successful people's career paths go it's typically like okay they go through a learning phase, whether that's in school or the first couple of years of their career building phase where they're like starting to gain momentum and get promotions, whatever that looks like the leading phase when they're like, you know, Jack Welch, the CEO of GE for however many years. And then like pretty much all of them end with like teaching or giving back right in whatever way. And it's like, okay, if that's, if all of these successful people always end by giving back, I should be incorporating that right now, whatever phase I'm in, you know, I agree. like, so it's, but it's, again, it's, it's hard to keep that in the, in the front of your mind when you're not. I, I agree. And I think, I think people are realizing, like, I mean, I've certainly been thinking about it 
sounds like you have too. It's like, it, I, I think there's a way to accelerate it. Right. And so it, it's, it definitely takes like focus and time and attention and effort. And so like, maybe instead of doing it when you're 65, you're doing it when you're 40. Right. Or that like, I, I don't know. I, I still haven't figured it out clearly because yeah. I'm, I'm a, uh, I don't have the answer, but, but it's something I'm definitely actively, you know, trying to think about. Yeah. All right, Kevin, you've done so much, accomplished so much. Um, one, I'm curious of all the things you've done and it might be tangible or intangible. What are you most proud of? And then if you could reflect on the three most important lessons you've either learned or been told, uh, that have been valuable to you in your life, what would those be? Sure. Uh, I think the most important thing I'm proud of or done, uh, I think it's, I look, I love building things, but I love doing it with other people. And I think the relationships that I've been able to build and do, like, I love the idea of like a team and teamwork and working together to accomplish a goal. So it's not like it was like one clear event or person or, you know, or a thing that happened that I'm most proud of. I think it's a collective um, it's a collective of all those things over the years and working with so many amazing people and gaining insights and perspectives from people that I'm sort of most, I, I guess, proud of or excited about that. I, I get to do that every day. You know, it's pretty, it's pretty cool. Um, and then what was the, what was the second question? Three life lessons for lack of a better term. Um, perseverance right and resiliency so you've got to have you've got to be you've got to be positive i'm a i'm a uh a rational like optimist right i'm always i'm I'm always like grounded in reality but i'm super optimistic but you have to have that like 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 life is not like a straight line up right it's like a roller coaster and you got ups downs and like that could be in your daily life that could be over longer periods of time you have to stay positive and I'm a big believer of willing things into existence and it all comes from like mental toughness. And so that's a big one for me. Um, stay constantly curious, which is what I talked about earlier. I think like you need to constantly be learning new things, working your mind. Um, if you, if you want to be just engaged and successful and, and stimulated, like for me, I want to be mentally stimulated. So I, I'd say like be, you know, constantly curious. And then I think the third thing and this applies in life, but I think particularly to business, it's not talked about enough, is just be a good person. Um, you're never gonna get everyone to like you. There's obviously, you know, you're in a business deal, like some people, um, you know, like not everyone's gonna like you, right? But it's business. But do your best to be a good person, do right by people, treat people well. And then I think like that's just a, like, uh, that, that will all reflect back on the, like the success that you have in life. And so try to be a good person. And, and, and uh, I think that's really important. Hmm. Kevin, I really enjoyed this conversation. I have a ton to learn from you and uh, what you've built is amazing. And I'm excited to see how it grows and what's next for you. So thank you for, for sitting down with me. And um, I look forward to staying in touch. Yeah, man, this was a lot of fun. I really, really appreciate it.